Welcome everybody. I wanted to go ahead and get started. It's just a little bit after five and I'm just so excited to be here with you all tonight. My name is Susan Askew and this is our second virtual Swanee Club event. And so um, we just miss you all uh, so much when we can be together, but we're just grateful that you are here tonight and we love being able to connect with you all this way. If this had been a traditional Swanee Club event, we would give you a brief update for um, news from the campus. And so before we hear from our special guests, and so I wanna kind of stick with that, um, that agenda because I just love to talk about Swanee and uh, we have some good news to share. So first, I just wanna tell you what a beautiful day it was in Swanee and it's actually been a beautiful spring. And we are right now mourning what would have been commencement week for our seniors. And we're just super sad for them, but we are committed to holding a traditional commencement service for them at another time when, um, when, when we're able to be together. But on what would have been commencement on May 10th, we will celebrate with them virtually. The vice chancellor will confer their degrees and will also share who are award winners for the academic honors. So, um, uh, so that's kind of what we're, we're dealing with with commencement and we will have a future commencement, one that they totally deserve. Um, and a date that will work for everybody. There's some big news that came out of campus today. As you may know, the um, Bishop Neil Alexander is retiring from his role as Dean of the School of Theology. And so we did a nationwide search to find that new Dean. And um, turns out he was right here all along. So today we announced that Jim Terrell will be the new Dean of the School of Theology, and he's been the Associate Dean and at the seminary for 17 years. And he's married to a college graduate, and it's just um, some exciting news I wanted to share with you all. I hope you've got your calendars marked for May 19th, which is Tiger Tuesday, and you'll be hearing much more from the Swanee Fund about that soon, but um, this year, that day, which is considered our day of giving, is really more important than ever. And um, we uh, really will need you all to help us uh, support our most pressing needs that day because um, when this whole coronavirus, COVID-19 took place, it's really had a significant impact on us financially with um, having to refund the room and board for our students that could not come back. And also we've had to cancel all of our summer programs, which are primarily revenue generating. So um, be on the lookout for Tiger Tuesday. And I just want to say thank you ahead of time for what you'll do for Swanee on that day. Um, also, uh, that we have some exciting news about the fall. Of course, we are planning for a variety of different scenarios for what it will look like to um, bring our students back, but we are operating full speed ahead as if it will uh, return in August. Our freshman class is incredible. The admission staff has done a fantastic job recruiting quality students that will be good fits here at Swanee. And we are like 80 students ahead of uh, the freshman class that was admitted last year. So that's good news. And uh, we opened up registration and we have a full slate of students who have registered, 1700 plus students. So we are up for a, just a wonderful year if everything can just fall into place. But that is really exciting news on that front of um, our student body for the next year. Um, we are still following rules that our Tennessee governor has in place. Um, so most of us are still working from home and um, 
our downtown businesses are have been allowed to reopen and uh, everyone's just taking into consideration um, safety first but um, we're just missing seeing you here on campus and we just can't wait to be together and I could keep talking about Swanee but I know the main reason you are here tonight is to hear from our special guests we have an exciting program we've had an incredible response um, to this event tonight and so uh, I hope you're gonna just enjoy it so much. But we have two Swanee alums, Norman Jetmanson and David Cruz, and they're both class of 76. And they're both have sent students here, uh, children here as students to Swanee. But um, you're j I just can't wait for you to see what they have done, but they have teamed up and they have, um, they are working on a documentary about this legendary, 1899 football team and they've done so much research they've done fundraising to um, make this project happen they've just done this they've taken it on and uh, they have a really exciting story to tell and so I'm gonna let them tell it and turn it over I think to Norman first thank you guys for being here thank you Susan and thanks to all of you out there watching tonight it's kind of odd to do something like this via zoom but we really appreciate this um david cruz my friend and roommate from sewanee and i have been working on this for probably about four years now we've done a lot of research a lot of interviews and we wanted to share with you tonight a little bit about the story we've learned some of the interviews we've done and to try to give you a flavor for what this team is all about, what it means to Sewanee. And I want to also mention, as in, is typical for great Sewanee alums, several alums heard what we were doing, called us up and volunteered to help. And I want to acknowledge them, Kate Gillespie, Lloyd Lockridge, and Amelia Coke Lockridge, who have all done tremendous work to help us. Also, a lot of you on here are donors and we're greatly appreciated, appreciate your donations because we couldn't do this work without that. And a shout out too to the Swanee staff, faculty and leadership from the vice chancellor down. Everyone's been very supportive of this. We've got a lot of great interviews from Swanee folks and uh, we're delighted to um, share some of those with you tonight. I want to make one caveat. We're going to show you some of the video interviews we've done. We filmed all of these in a very high quality, high definition film, and that doesn't translate well to Zoom. So um, bear with us if it's not quite what um, our final product will look like, but I think you'll get the gist of it. So, we can debate who was the greatest football team in college football history, but there's one achievement that is beyond debate, and that is which team had the most extraordinary single season ever. And for the answer to that, as you have guessed, we've got to go back to the year 1899. Let me tell you a little bit about that year. The president was William McKinley, there were 45 states. The Spanish-American War Treaty was signed that year. Horse and buggy were the primary means of local transportation and long distance travel was by train. An interesting tidbit on this horse and buggy you see on your screen is the uh, fella in the front uh, seat with the S is Preston Brooks, who was a member of the 1899 football team. His uh, grandfather was famous as a senator from South Carolina because he caned on the Senate floor the Massachusetts senator when they got in an argument before the Civil War about slavery. Um, and another important thing was there was a yellow fever epidemic in 1898, which stopped a lot of football games from happening and had a great impact on colleges and life in general. Also by 1899, although the Civil War was starting to fade, it was still very much a stinging memory 
for those in the South. It had ended 34 years before. The South was still recovering from Reconstruction and the defeat of the war. And on the Cumberland Plateau, small Sewanee was struggling to survive. And at its initial founding, the founders had a grand vision that we're gonna take the 5,000 acres donated to Sewanee and make it a grand university, not only with undergraduates, but with a number of graduate schools, including law, medicine, pharmacy, and others. And it was envisioned to be one of the largest universities in the entire South. That vision was shattered by the Civil War. Several of the, of the founders, original founders died during the war and Suwannee's treasury was depleted. The original cornerstone was blown up by Union troops and Suwannee was hanging on for dear life in the late 1890s. The, um, the campus in 1899 would still be recognized by all of us today. Uh, as you see, Breslin Tower and Walsh Hall were very much a part of the campus by that time. Um, Sewanee had, uh, as you can see in this photo, fences to keep some of the pigs and animals uh, fenced in. The roads were, of course, dirt. And if you think in modern day terms how isolated you can sometimes feel at Sewanee, think what it was like in 1899. In 1899, Suwannee was, of course, all male. There were 326 students, 122 of which were undergraduates, 26 were theology students, 17 were law students, and 161 were medical students. And the population of Suwannee then was approximately 1,300 people. In the late 1890s, there was another invasion from the North a new college sport called football. It had started in the Northeast um, with uh, at Princeton and Rutgers playing the first game in 1869, and it was becoming incredibly popular. It was, um, it was new to the South, though, in the 1890s, and we would not recognize a football game from the 1800s today because it was much more like rugby. In fact, the first game between Princeton and Rutgers has been described as a brawl called kill the ball carry. Sewanee began playing football in 1891. First game was against Tennessee. And very early on, Suwannee, we found references to Suwannee being known as the Tigers. There's a cheer from 1899 that talks about them being the Tigers and the Suwannee Purple in the early 1900s notes that we are clearly known as the Tigers. In 1895, Suwannee joined the Southern Intercollegiate Athletic Association and it was formed in 1895 for quote, the development and purification of college athletics throughout the South. I'm showing you some photos of early football games. You'll see that it's, it's very different from the game we know today, and we'll get into the rules momentarily. Um, but here is a, a little bit of some of the video footage we've... There's a football mania in the southern states that I think is unmatched in the rest of the country. And Swanee was an early part of that. The 1890s as a decade was a decade of football for Swanee. And it began not in 1899, it began in 1891. On November the 21st, 1891, Swanee beat Tennessee 24 to nothing. When the word was transmitted by telegraph from Knoxville to Swanee that we had defeated Tennessee, Students began ringing the bell, and a great Sewanee party ensued. They began to build a bonfire that moved closer and closer to the bandstand itself, and finally they set on fire the drill stand, the bandstand, and it made a glorious 
bonfire, uh, 70, 80 feet tall in the air, lit up the sky in the night uh, in celebration of Swanee's victory over Tennessee. I'm not sure that I would say that football became a religion at Swanee because it seems that football for the students at least, those who played as well as those who watched, was more important than religion. Religion was daily chapel requirement, maybe attendance on Sunday, but football was what you talked about, what you bet on, what you read about, what became part of your everyday life. The earth seemed to shake when the Sewanee Tigers trotted onto the field. Another important thing I want to mention, because this relates to Sewanee today with this vision of student athletes. In 1899, Vice Chancellor Wiggins required that all football players be full-time students and that they maintain a B average. This is significant because a number of colleges at that time had what they called tramp or ringer athletes who were not full-time students, but were brought in simply to play football. And in fact, the star player on North Carolina's team, the last game that Sewanee played that year may have been such a, a ringer athlete. Another thing is that one of the reasons football started catching on in the South is that it carried with it vestiges of war and manhood. Many of the students and players had either fathers or grandfathers who had fought in the Civil War. And as they did not have wars to fight at that time, uh, necessarily, football became a substitute for that and was a way for them to prove their manhood. We tend to think of football as being something that is in the blood of Southerners, Southern men, Southern women too everyone. I'm from Alabama. I've been thinking about football since probably in utero. So we think of football as being something that is genetically Southern. It isn't. It has become that way. And For Sewanee, as Professor Smith said the first game was in 1891. Importantly, for our purposes, Hardy McGee Field, where you go to football games today, is the same field which uh, Sewanee began playing in eight, on in 1891 and, of course, played on in 1899. So it's the oldest football field in the South and the fourth oldest football field in the country. It is the oldest field in the South, and we've been playing football on it since 1891. It's one of the great places to watch a college football game. The fog rolls in, and if you're sitting in the stands, you can't see anything on the field. Uh, the, the, you know, we'll punt the ball. <laughs> you have no idea. You know, you can hear if it was blocked, but you just can't see where it's going to land or who has it. And I think all of us have experienced games like that at Sewanee. Let me talk briefly about some of the rules, because as I said, this was a, a much different game than what we know today. In 1899, there was no forward passing. The uh, offense had three downs to make five yards. They, uh, importantly, and this really plays into the remarkable achievement of this team, players not only played both ways, offense and defense and kicking, but if they came out of the game for any reason, they could not return. So players had to play hurt and didn't come out of the game unless they absolutely had to. Coaches were not allowed to coach from the sidelines. They had to sit in the stands and watch. All the plays were called by players. There were two 35-minute halves. And back then, the kicking game was considered one of the most important aspects, not just punting and kicking off, but uh, field goals were worth five points, which was the same as a touchdown. So a touchdown and a field goal, both were worth five points. If you scored a touchdown, you could kick an extra point for an additional point. And they also had safeties. But it was a much different game than we know today. And it was very hurry up. Play 
players themselves called every play. Coaches were not on the sidelines during the game. They had to be in the stands. The coaches didn't stand on the sideline and signal in the plays or have a player come over and tell him to play and he runs out onto the field. It gives you an idea of how well prepared these teams had to be to be able to execute anything. The captain of the team would use numbered codes for plays. The minute the ball is down, you take formation, the codes announce the next play. So it's boom, 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 boom at a very fast pace. You didn't have huddles. Everything was sort of a continuous sort of exhaustion game. It was a hurry up, no huddle back in 1899. So they're back at the line of scrimmage. And of course, they're gouging each other for this five yard mark in three plays. So it was like a short yardage goal line situation almost every snap. Uh, another important element to football in the 1890s was it was a very violent sport. They were biting, they were kicking, they were shoving. Um, the rules were a lot more lax and there was very rudimentary equipment. Uh, this pair of cleats, vintage cleats, or show where they basically took a pair of boots and they took strips of leather and glued or nailed those strips together one after another to layer up to have cleats. In the 1890s, leather helmets were just coming into vogue. Many players still played with uh, long hair as the only thing on their head. And um, a lot of them played with things like these metal nose guards or none at all. And the football was much more round. It was not made for passing since they didn't pass. And so it was a, a much different feel for a ball game. And uh, as I said, helmets, if they were existed at all, were not very solid. Some people know they played with leather helmets. What they don't know is some of them played without helmets, period. In fact, if you look at pictures of my grandfather in those days, he had very thick hair that he cut in a bowl because he wanted to protect his head. The pictures of the 1899 team, if you look up, I think on the third or fourth row back, you'll see Wild Bill Claiborne. And he's the only one with, I think, a leather helmet on on the squad. Everybody else has got their hats off. And he's got a pretty wild look about it. And we'll come back to Claiborne in a minute. Football back then was not only violent and a lot of injuries, but there are also a number of deaths. In the late 1890s and early 1900s, there were probably between 15 and 25 deaths a year. Part of that was the violence of the game. Part of it was in order to gain extra yards, uh, offensive linemen would grab straps on the running back and throw him over the line of scrimmage for extra yards. And sometimes defenders would throw one of the defenders uh, over the line of scrimmage to try to tackle in the backfield. A lot of those folks landed on their heads, broke their necks, and uh, deaths got to such an extent that by the early 1900s, there were many calls to ban football. One of the people who stepped in was President Teddy Roosevelt, who in 1905 called together a group of people, Walter Camp and others, to the White House. And he said to them that football had become too violent and too deadly, and if they didn't clean up the game, it was probably going to be banned. That meeting led to an early organization for college athletics, which ultimately led to the formation of the NCAA. And some of you know our delightful Swanee alum, Joe Wiegan, who travels the world uh, portraying Teddy Roosevelt, and he made a guest appearance for our film. Uh, now, uh, uh, going back uh, to football, I think it's very important to know that football is like life. No flinching, no fouling, and hit the line hard. So let's go to the team of 1899. This is one of the famous photographs of the team on the steps of old Hoffman Hall. There were 21 players on the team. 
there was also a, a coach and a student manager. The captain of the team was Henry Diddy Siebels, who was a running back and kicker. And as Woody said earlier, the captain was a very important, important part of the team. He was like a second coach. It was his job to keep the morale of the players up. And during the game, he had to call all the plays, make sure the defense was lined up properly. It was a big role because the coach wasn't on the sidelines to help him. One of the most fascinating characters was named Luke Lee. Luke Lee was a student at Sewanee. He had graduated in 1898, but came back to get a graduate degree not so much to get another degree as to run the football program because then all football was run by students. There were no athletic departments, no administration. This was all run by students. And Luke Lee is a fascinating character. His job uh, as manager would really be what we call an athletic director today. He did all the scheduling. He handled all the money, handled all the equipment, um, he, all the travel, all the hotels, and think about that. He did this in a time where he had to do it by telegram. There were no phones. There was very little electricity. So he had to do this all by telegram to set this up. And, um, I wish we had a lot more time to tell you, but let me just give you one story. Luke Lee went on to found the Nashville, Tennessee, newspaper. He was one of the youngest U.S. senators ever. But also, he fought in World War I, and at the end of the war, without telling his superiors, he got a group of soldiers together to go to Belgium and try to kidnap the Kaiser and bring him to Paris for reparations. He, all, he got all the way into the house and almost succeeded. And uh, that shows you a little bit about his ingenuity, his initiative, and his vision. The coach of the team was Herman Milton Billy Souter. He was called Billy. He was a student at Princeton and had been a roommate of the coach in Sewanee in 1898, a, ma a man named J.G. Lady Jane. Lady Jane moved on to North Carolina in 1899 and he recommended his roommate Souter. And Souter came in um, full of ideas about football in the in the North, brought a lot of energy and a lot of new tactics. And a number of the players later in life said that Souter was the person who introduced the quick kick to the South. And it's part of the reason Swanee was so successful because many teams had never seen a quick kick before and they utilized that to great advantage. Swanee's schedule in 1898 was also very unusual for that time. Most schools in the South played three or four games a year, primarily because traveling between schools in the South was so difficult. In the Northeast, schools were five, 10, 15 miles apart. They could easily travel to play each other, but that was not the case in the South. But in 1899, Luke Lee crafted the together a 12 game schedule to be played in just six weeks. And an important component of this is that the biggest game in the South, not only then, but into the 1910s and 20s was Sewanee Vanderbilt on Thanksgiving day, where Sewanee made enough out of the gate receipts from that one game to pay for uh, their season. But in 1899, Lee was unable to get come to terms with Vanderbilt and to make up for that lost revenue he came up with this incredible scheme he was going to get his team on a train travel to Austin Texas and play five games in six days and travel 2,500 miles by train this is the famous mountain goat uh, from Sewanee that's what they would take from the mountain down to Cowan to get on the other trains and he crafted this incredible schedule, not only 12 games in six weeks, which is amazing, but five games in six days. And they were gonna play Texas in Austin, Texas A&M in Houston, Tulane in New Orleans, and they were gonna take Sunday off, 
then LSU and Baton Rouge on Monday, and Ole Miss and Memphis on Tuesday. An incredible scenario. I would love to have been in that room when he brought up the idea, hey, here's a great idea that's going to help generate some revenue. We're going to travel around throughout the South and in six days and play five games. I mean, it's, it's unheard of. He's not thinking about the history books. He's thinking about maintaining the program at Swanee. But he certainly saw uh, the uh, great potential of this team and of this story and of this uh, itinerary uh, that he put together for the 1899 team. They had taken a beating, but had won before. Uh, now they were going on to the next one, uh, riding across the country, trying to sleep some, looking out the windows, uh, some of them going to places they had never seen before. Uh, it had to be exciting. It had to be one of the greatest adventures of college students of that generation as they went from school to school to school. Another um, aspect of this that David and I have uh, learned about and are very uh, interested in is I said there were 21 players, a uh, student manager and a coach. But there was at least one other gentleman, and possibly two, who were integral to the team's success, and we know almost nothing about them. They were African Americans who lived in Sewanee, who worked basically as athletic trainers, and they played an important role. There's very little mention of them anywhere. There's a brief mention of Cal Burris in the uh, Sewanee Purple. The other African-American, we don't even know his name, and we have no photographs of them, but they were the unsung heroes of this team. And uh, we want to br bring uh, due light to what they contributed. One of the people that was part of that whole team, though, was the trainer. The 1899 team had a rub down man. This was an African-American by the name of Cal Burris. And as the players had aches and pains, literally, Cal would rub them down. The pain from the, the beatings that the players took was so acute that they would wake up in the middle of the night. And then they would call these men in again and wake them up. And they would come in and rub their muscles, rub their joints, and help them fall asleep again. We know a lot about virtually every play that the Sewanee team executed throughout the season. But we don't know much about these rubbers, except that they were there and that the players regarded their ministrations, regarded their services as vital. And as all of you have seen the famous poster, they played five games in six days and it said that on the seventh day they rested. But in fact, they did not rest because after that grueling road trip where they were described at the Ole Miss game as being the bandaged boys in purple, they were all beat up. They still had to play three more games, including the two toughest teams in the South at that time, Auburn and North Carolina. They won all 12 games. They not only went 12 and 0, but the only team to score on them the entire season was Auburn, who scored 10 points. So Sewanee in that year scored 320 points to their opponent's 10. There are a lot of great stories. I'm gonna go through just a couple of them to give you a flavor for the kind of lore and uh, mystique about these, this team. One is uh, the captain, Diddy Siebels, I've already mentioned. He was elected to the College Football Hall of Fame a tremendous player for the team. And here are some, uh, some of his descendants and relatives talking about him. My grandfather was a smash player. In other words, he hit anything that was in front of him and tried to run him over. He wasn't a big man. I mean, I think he was about 5'10", but he was determined. Everybody called him a bulldog. I mean, what he wanted to do, he wanted to do in business, in football, in everything. And I think he just drove that team to victory by his determination. We were very fortunate in doing this film at this time. Mrs. Siebel's a delightful lady, 
is in her 90s and she she still spoke fondly about her father-in-law Diddy Siebel's. We also don't have time to show you but we interviewed one of Luke Lee's daughters and that was also fascinating. So uh, to to find people still living who know, knew some of the people on the team is fascinating. Another interesting character that you heard mentioned earlier, William Wild Bill Claiborne, he had a discolored or fake eye that um, we don't know where the injury originally came from, but he wore a patch during games. And the story goes that when he lined up against an opponent to start a game, he would lift the patch, point at his eye and say, this happened in the last game, we'll see what happens today. And he went on to be an accomplished Episcopal priest up in the Cumberland Plateau. He's renowned for what he did. And this is a portrait uh, that hangs in Odie Parish today. When they went to Ole Miss at the end of the road trip, um, the Ole Miss players objected because some of the Suwannee players had leather helmets and all Ole Miss had was long hair. In fact, their nickname then was the Long-Haired Oval Knights of Ole Miss. But the ref didn't let them get by with that protest and they had to play the game. The most gruesome game of the season was against Auburn. They were coached by John Heisman. Uh, they, one of the tactics they used was they had sewn leather ha handles on the, their football pants so that uh, the players could grab the handles and either form an illegal wedge or grab the handles and, and throw some of the linemen forward. S Swanee's coach, when he saw that, instructed the Swanee players to fly at them feet f cleat first at their legs and try to break that up. And sometime during the game, uh, the refs stopped the game and made them cut off the handles, which outraged Heisman and his team and took, importantly, took time away from playing the game. My Uncle Emmett came down to my grandfather at halftime and said, Diddy, you've got to do something. We bet the house on the game. We're down 10 to nothing. You've got to do something. We'll lose the house. We have to kick your mother out. And in fact, there were not only the taking time to cut the handles off, a number of fights broke out, guns were pulled. There was a lot of wagering in the game. It was on, on Thanksgiving day in Montgomery and 4,000 people came. There were no grandstands and they all stood around the field. So it was quite a display of uh, unruly crowds in football. And you agreed at the beginning of the game, the rules, including if the game were to be called for darkness. There were so many delays during the game that even though Auburn was the better team and probably could have won, uh, the breaths called the game for darkness after 14 minutes of the second half. Heisman was so outraged by this, he wrote a, wrote a long letter to the Birmingham Age Herald newspaper uh, saying basically that the refs had cheated him. The ref then wrote a letter back saying that um, he was a crybaby. Heisman wrote another letter back. It's an incredible series of letters. And of course that would never happen today under the NCAA, but it shows uh, how feisty they were then. Another important player on the team, Orman Simpkins, he was a fullback on the team. He was one of the great tacklers on the team. His father had manned the cannon that fired the first shot at Fort Sumter. And Simpkins is important because not only was he, he a star player on the team, but he played hurt. Later in life, uh, he had one of his legs amputated due to injuries from playing football. And he was very bitter about it. Uh, thought that Luke Lee and Suter had made him play when he was injured. And then he went back in to have his second leg amputated and died on the operating table. So this is a great story about glory and, and winning, but it's also a story about sacrifice and pain. So this was an amazing season. We call uh, this team the Iron Men of Sewanee. But they were iron men not because they were made of iron, 
they were flesh and blood, but they played through the injuries. Their accomplishment that season will never be repeated. And uh, many of them went on to fight in World War I. Many went on to live long and productive productive lives, but not all of them. Some died of suicide, some died of uh, injuries, some died of illness. And so they leave a legacy of grit and determination and perseverance. And as Vice Chancellor McArdle said in our interview, you, you talk about the lore of this team, but he said, this is more than lore, it's true. And then we have another historian putting some of this in perspective as well. Well, we tell ourselves stories to give meaning to what's happened, to try to make some sense of the present and maybe to tell us where to go or how to get there. And so myth and history are intimately intertwined. Sometimes it's impossible to separate them out. Myth itself simply means an organizing story. It doesn't necessarily mean it didn't happen. You know, Sawani is a fabulous combination of ecclesiastical tradition, southern tradition, literary tradition, liquid tradition. You put all those together, and it's amazing that there's anything uh, factually based uh, when you when you throw it together. And this was a story not only of a great team in 1899. But their achievement helped to invigorate the university and help them survive some very tough times. It's been a source of inspiration for every Sewanee uh, alum and everybody who loves Sewanee ever since. It's an incredible story. And as David and I have dug into this and expected to find a lot of uh, lore and not a lot of truth, we have in fact found the opposite. There's a lot of truth to what we thought was just lore. It's amazing. And as Woody said in one of our interviews, they were known as a team for the ages. We put together several posters which are available on our website, or you can go to the Blue Chair in Sewanee and purchase them. I hope you'll take a look at these. We've had fun making them. One of the, let me, I can't go back, but one is the, the first one was the stained glass in All Saints with the Sewanee Chair. Then here's one about the team and its achievement. And then we had fun with this one, We Want Bama. Um, so what does, what does the team of 1899 mean to Swanee? I can't think of anyone better to talk about that than Professor Jerry Smith. So for little Swanee to beat all those schools was not just a miraculous display of great football on our part. It was an existential validation of the powerless against the powerful. 1899 iron got us through a string of bad times as nothing else could have done. Basically, it restored and preserved faith in Sewanee. The emotion about 1899 is not just a celebration of football. It is a triumph over both adversity and power. We faced the giants and won. The stories, the victories are few, infused with biblical imagery, and especially that of young little David facing the giant Goliath and winning. But this is not just a story to brag about, but a story to inspire. Religion is about redemption and salvation. So I was about to disappear, overshadowed by the mighty and pushed aside. So I was about to be lost. But 99 Iron not only won games, it saved Sewanee. Winning creates allegiance. But what 99 did was to create faith in everything that Sawani was and could become. The story of 99 Iron lives not because of games and scores, but because it took Sawani to a greater vision of itself. And with that, um, I'm going to let David take over to talk about um, the title for our film and to fill you in on a few other details and David just tell me when you want me to move the slides and I'll do it. Okay. Um are y'all able to hear me? Yeah. Apologize for, for jumping on late, but uh Norman, as everybody can tell, is the smart, articulate part of our documentary team. And um uh our the the 
we kept, Norman and I came up with the, the, the title of this, Unrivaled. And in the course of, of my interview with uh, Vince Dooley, the legendary Georgia football national championship, and is a real historian of, uh, of college football, he used the term unrivaled in the course of his interview uh, that, that we conducted with him. And so that confirmed to Norman and I that we had come up with the correct, uh, the, I think the most uh, telling title and the most appropriate title for our, our film. Um, you know, so, so Norman, if you would play our, the clip with, um, with Vince, I'd appreciate it. The 99 Swanee team will be unrivaled. No team ever in the history of college football will ever be able to do what they did. Um, Norman, at the beginning of, of, of this, um, mentioned uh, some thanks to some people who really contributed big time to this, some of you who helped uh, fund this, um, and a few others. I also want to mention uh, uh, Brad Joy. A couple of the interviews you see in here We've done 40 interviews so far, and a couple of them, Norman and I didn't have the heft or clout to get on our own, um, and, uh, but Brad Joy, our good friend and classmate, was able to help us get John Meacham and, and get Kirk Herbstreet, and we definitely appreciate that. We need all the help we can get, and I, we appreciate uh, Brad in particular. So I want, we want to conclude this with um, the the trailer we did, which really is not so much of a trailer, though we call it that. Um, it's a three minute preview. We did it early on after we'd only done five um, interviews uh, for the film. As I mentioned, since then we've done 40 interviews. And, um, and with those 40 interviews and all the, the other documents and letters and, and materials that we, we have gathered, um, I think we'll be able to, to, to knit together a really suspenseful and dramatic film that really should rivet people's attention and tell the story whole and right. Um, before we go to, to this, this trailer slash preview that gives you a sense of the arc of, of, of the film and the arc of the season, I also just want to uh, um, uh, give a shout out to Woody Register. You can see he's part of the backbone of this film. And, and Woody uh, had the stamina, stamina to sit through a, a marathon four-hour interview session. I've done a number of documentary films. I've never had anyone willing to sit through a four-hour interview in one fell swoop without a break. Um, but Woody did it, and we're very grateful to him for that. So, Norman, would you now play the uh, the the three minute uh, trailer that we put together um, for the film. Sure, and let me say, after this, for those of you who can stay on, we will do a Q and A and happy to answer any questions. The 1899 University of South football team has to be the most amazing story in college football history. Football was just starting and the rules were changing fairly frequently back then. Players did not leave the game. There were no substitutions. So the players were expected that unless they were crippled or killed on the field of play, they were to stay in because it was unmanly, it was cowardly to leave. They would have to drag you from the field. This was a poor area of the country. Anything like that that people could do and do really, really well probably had magnified significance. And then given the Scots-Irish temperament of parts of the South, if it had a little violence in it, well, that was even better. This 1899 team and the teams that it played were part of making football Southern. One of the most colorful characters in the whole band of it was Luke Lee. Luke Lee pretty much ran the football program. He was a business manager. He was fiercely ambitious. You don't become the youngest man to go to the U.S. Senate without a good deal of ambition and uh, a good idea of how to get there. He put together the road trip and apparently he had negotiated with Vanderbilt and he didn't like the terms. The fact that we didn't play Vanderbilt in 1899 led Luke Lee to be creative in how he was going to make up the receipts that we were going to lose by not playing a rival. Luke Lee got this chance to play at the University of Texas. But he knew he 
he had to offset the cost of travel. So that's why he arranged for the games with Texas A&M, Tulane, LSU, and Mississippi. The amount of work it took to put together this trip was tremendous. And this is all done by students. Tulane was located in the middle of nowhere. The team had to play anybody had to get on a train and ride. This train trip, 2,500 miles long. The legendary team of 1899 on this famous road trip played five games winning all five games without allowing a single point in six days. And then on the seventh day, they rested. How those people could have played five games in six days and ride the train. I wonder if they slept in their seats. The fact that at one time we played against and prevailed over these schools that are now nationally known football powerhouses, really in athletics, it is the ultimate David versus Goliath story. People on campus saw this as a team for the ages. It's more than lore, it's true. These were young men who did something truly extraordinary, and they did it for the love of the game. That accomplishment will never happen again. It's unparalleled in the annals of college football. It will be remembered as long as they're lacing up the football. Anytime anything is ever written about the history of college football, Swanee will be mentioned. And everyone who cares about college football should know their story. So everybody should should know that um, this this little trailer here is on our, our website um, for this film. And if anyone wants to view it again or view it with more, more clarity, you can see it on that on our website. Um, and please feel free to direct others to that website um, so they can engage in the, the, the whole uh, arc of, of, that, of that season and that team. There's a lot of good material on there as well as this trailer. So questions, anybody? Yeah, we do have uh, some questions. Um, here is one. Um, the first one was, why did Swanee play Ole Miss in Memphis and not in Oxford? Because you can make more money in Memphis. Oxford, is, 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 which is where I live today, is a very small community. Back in the 1899, it was teeny, very Faulknerian back in that, in that day. So you can make more money, and money, the need for revenues drove so much of this season. And the, the teams were split the gate receipts, so it was very important. The bigger the crowd, the bigger the receipts, so that was a key. And you, as you can imagine, that grueling road trip, can you imagine being on a steam locomotive and the t how tired you'd be? By the time they got to Memphis, that the Sewanee boys, the Bandage boys, um, were were really worn out and yet they were still able able to prevail over over Ole Miss. Great. Thanks for that. Here's another question. It says in your research, have you come across Hudson Stuck and his impact on Swanee football of the day, including the 1899 team? Norman, I'll defer to you. I haven't I'm I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, that's not a name we're familiar with. So whoever asked that, if you got information, please send it because we're always digging up stuff. Yeah, because our, our one of our many goals with this, you know, we want to tell a dramatic story without over dramatizing it. But we all, we're trying to tell this, make this the definitive film, the fin definitive documentary film about it. So if there are any holes in our story, we want to fill them now as we're starting the editing process. Right, and along those lines, somebody, we're, we're also streaming this on Facebook, has asked some questions there. Um, what is the anticipated completion time frame, and will people be able to purchase this on DVD or Blu-ray? You know, we, I, uh, I'll speak for myself, and, and I normally weigh in as well. We don't want to be tied down to a specific um, uh, date for a premiere where this is, will be ready because we want to tell it right. That Norman and I both have day jobs, full-time day jobs, and, and you know we spend uh, occasional nights and weekends uh, knitting this together and telling it right. We still have a lot to do. We didn't raise quite as much uh, money as we had hoped to 
Um, but we're able, we're going to be able to make it for what we raised. If we had a little bit more, we could make it even stronger uh, and more compelling. Um, so, so we don't want to, we don't want to give a definitive date. We don't quite know when it'll be out. Our goal would be to have it out this fall. Hopefully we can do that. We've been waylaid a little bit as you, as everybody knows, we'd, we'd hope to do a little bit of filming on the Suwannee campus, um, do a, a, a reenactment or two. Uh, but because of coronavirus, uh, we've been unable to do that. We had some uh, uniforms, period uniforms and clothing being manufactured. That manufacturing company that does vintage clothing uh, had to shut down for coronavirus. So, you know, we've been delayed a little bit, which makes it more difficult for us to give you a, a precise uh, time there. Yes, you will be able to purchase uh, uh, the film uh, when it's done. And all the revenues uh, um, from... From the film or you know Swanee will own this film once Norman Norman and I have co complete creative control over it to tell the story right but then when we're completed it we're turning it over to Suwannee and Suwannee will own the film so I guess ultimately it'll be up to Suwannee to decide what they want to do in terms of selling the film. Great and, but, and while we're sort of on that topic um, I know that you guys aren't getting paid either and it, you really are relying on the fundraising um, and you mentioned that uh, you've you've raised a, a pretty good amount, but um, I, you just just to complete the project in a different way, you um, you're still accepting donations. Is that correct? We, we are, and I, I appreciate you making that point. Norman and I are, are both doing this free, gratis, you know, on our own time. Every dollar that anybody gives to this goes directly to telling the story and directly to the film. And of course, all the contributions are made to Sewanee to defray uh, the cost of making this, which are, are not inconsiderable these days to do it fully, wholly, accurately, dramatically, and, and right. Um, uh, so, so yes, we are still accepting money. We, you, we didn't, what we've raised so far was, was really considerable, but it wasn't what we budgeted for the film. So we've had to trim back a little bit. If we got a little bit more money, we'd be able to tell this in a more compelling fashion. Great, well, good luck with all of that. The next question, why didn't Swanee Iron 99 play Alabama that year? That, because they were, they were scared of us. <laughs> that, um, that I think once he did 12, he just couldn't have fit another game in. Um, one interesting tidbit is that the original Alabama fight song, which they no longer sing, but the original one, the first stand, first line of the first stanza is about Sewanee. So uh, that's how uh, that's how big Sewanee football was. And that was in 1926 when they came up with that song. But they didn't play them in that year. They did play them a lot of other games. You know, is, and of course, I think as, as most, probably many of you will know, you know, Suwannee was an inaugural member of the uh, Southeastern Conference. Um, we didn't fare very well because by the time, and it, we became a, a, a member of that Southeastern Conference because of Suwannee's prowess in the early 1900s from 1899 on. But by the time we got into the, the SEC was formed, you know, these big state schools had kind of eclipsed us in terms of, of finances and, and manpower. And the, the we, we remained small and they kept uh, going forward. So we I'm not sure we belonged in the SEC except because of our history. Um, and uh, uh, Sewanee unfortunately never won a game uh, when we were in the SEC. And then along with uh, other inaugural members of uh, uh, Georgia Tech and Tulane, uh, Sewanee got out of the, uh, of the SEC. Great, so why is that team, the 1899 team, not the national champs that year? There, at that time, there was no national champ and Two things. One is everybody knew after they beat Auburn and went to play North Carolina that um, whoever won that game was going to be called the champion of the South. Also, as I mentioned earlier, football started in the Northeast. And the truth of the matter is they looked down their noses at football in the South. And 
didn't really care about it. So Sewanee wasn't even in the conversation with the uh, Northeastern schools. And it wasn't really until Alabama went to the Rose Bowl in I think 1926 and one, that put Southern football on the map for the first time. Until then, we were considered second rate. Right. Um, let's see, we've got a couple questions here. Um, what happened to William Lee after he went to Belgium? That's from his nine-year-old son. Well, af after the World War I, Luke Lee came back and continued to run the Tennessean for many years. And uh, he had some setbacks uh, later in life, but um, was pardoned by the governor. But just an absolutely fascinating person, visionary, uh, strong-willed, incredibly smart, and a real key to, to this team. Yeah, and, 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 and as we may have mentioned already that, you know, you see uh, the, ambition, the ambitious season that Luke Lee put together plays out throughout his life. He had a, he had a as a student at Suwannee, he was very ambitious and created this one-of-a-kind, literally pioneering season among, for a Southern team. Uh, and then throughout his life, it's just ambition after ambition, accomplishment after accomplishment, and a, and a few setbacks along the way too. Uh, but as, as, as John Meacham said at one point in the interview I did with him, he said, um, if, uh, if, if there wasn't a Luke Lee, you'd have to make him up. It's, he's like a character out of fiction, except it's all real. It's all what actually happened in real life. A great, a great guy. Great, there's a couple questions, and this is a fun one. What was the 1900 season like? 1900 season, they won all but one game. They were undefeated in 1898, but they only played four games because of yellow fever. And 1899, they were undefeated. They won, if you look at the stained glass window, it actually has the number 22. They won 22 games in a row and then finally lost uh, at the end of the 1900 season or they would have had a three year undefeated streak. Right. Pretty remarkable. Here's a question. You had talked about how the scoring was a little bit different, how many points you got for different things. Do you all uh, touch on that in the film? Yeah, we, we absolutely will touch on that in the film. Absolutely. I, that's a, you know, we're trying to convey what football was like in that era. Uh, different rules, uh, different scoring. Only, it only, you know, you only had to get, you only had three three downs in order to get five yards. It wasn't four downs to get 10 yards. So you have all sorts of differences. The, the ball back then, as Norman mentioned in his, his presentation, great presentation, was you know, um, more like a rugby ball. And so the kicking game was so, so pivotal. Um, the ball was a lot easier to kick than, than the, the ball that we use today would have been. You couldn't, you couldn't do a drop kick very effectively with today's ball with the ball that was used back then. So the, the point of that is we bring, all, we weave all of that into this film. And just to give you one example, punting was incredibly important because part of Sewanee's um, uh, advantage was they were in incredible shape because they had gotten to practice all during the summer when most schools didn't start till the fall. And one of their strategies was they would oftentimes quick kick on first or second down pin the other team back and then hope for a fumble. And uh, in the North Carolina game, the last game of the season, there were 43 punts that game. And, and Suwannee barely survived. Um, North Carolina made it down to the three inch line and Suwannee held them at the three inch line to, uh, to preserve the victory. And the victory, Suwannee's victory was because of a, um, of a, of a field, a field goal, a, a, a drop kick field goal um, by Rex Kilpatrick, if, I, if my memory serves me correctly. So this is more about um, sort of some of your findings when you were doing some research, but did, were you able to determine was the tiger the mascot in 1899 for Swanee? 
Uh, I found a couple of references. I found one reference as early as 1892 to the term tiger. And then we found a cheer sheet that somebody wrote after the season in 1899, kind of uh, lauding the team. And in there, they used the word tigers. So it looks like by 1899, they were already known as the Tigers. They were, the newspaper articles uh, just called them the boys in purple or, or the purple. They were purple and white were the team colors. Um, but it looks like they were already known as the Tigers then. I sometimes, I sometimes wonder why we weren't called the mountain lions. Well, it's true. Um, this, this is one, why was Swanee's defense so dominant? It was a, it was a speed game. Uh, the players, most of the players were much smaller than today's players. One of the players on Swanee's team, a guy named uh, Bunny Pierce was 108 pounds. Um, the average weight of the team was around 169 pounds. So it, it was a much faster, uh, brutal game. But Orman Simpkins, who was not only a star halfback, was known as a vicious tackler, as was uh, Diddy Siebel's. And they just, and part of it was their conditioning. They were in better condition than a lot of the teams they played. And then a miracle is, with all the injuries that football had, these players made it through the entire season without being knocked out of the season. So it, it's pretty remarkable. So we don't have the picture to, to show as we're asking this question, but someone wants to know, who is the man standing on the top right of that photo with the P on his shirt? And they think it might be from Princeton. Well, the it P, is. The P is. Go ahead. That's, I'm Coach, sorry. that's Coach Suter. He was from Princeton, and some, some of the photographs he's got the P on um, but for Princeton, but that's Coach Suter. And by the, by the way, uh, since we're mentioning Coach Suter, he uh, went on to go to work for Luke Lee at the Nashville Tennessean, and he was the editor of the Nashville Tennessean, so the two of them continued to collaborate. I mean, Luke Lee hi hired Suter, and they continued to collaborate after their time at Swanee. And Suter, Suter then hired a young sports reporter named Grantland Rice and gave him his first chance to be a journalist. Right. Right. Um, I'll, I'll share all these questions with you when, when it's over, but there's a lot of comments more than questions, just a lot of excitement about the release date and um, that it's on the caliber of, a, you know, big stage kind of documentary. And so everybody's looking forward to that. And we hope we can have the red carpet debut here in Swanee. We certainly intend to let Swanee have the debut. Great. Or premiere, as we call it. <laughs> that's right that's right well what an incredible story that you all have shared with us and thank you guys so much for bringing it to life and uh, letting more and more Swanee people know all those incredible nuggets and stories that you all have shared so we just are looking forward to the final product and uh, we'll really celebrate when that comes out and we, we could only give you the tip of the iceberg. There are a lot more great stories we just didn't have time for. Yeah. What I love is that it's such an incredible story, and it's ours. I mean, it is Swanee's story, and um, it's just fantastic. Well, thank you guys for helping us kick off this virtual Swanee Club um, program uh, as we're trying to manage during this time where we can't be together. But we have our next one scheduled, everybody for um, June 3rd, and it's uh, going to be at 6 o'clock instead of 5, and uh, our special guest is going to be Jim Peterman with the Office of Civic Engagement, and um, we have a really kind of special secret announcement that we will make that night, um, so we'll hope you can join us for that. Anyway, I hope you guys have a wonderful Thursday and good weekend and we look forward to when we can be together again and thank you so much Norman and David. Thank you Susan and everybody. Be so, everybody stay healthy. Thank you very much. We're excited. <laughs>